Faith Over Fear is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational, faith-affirming podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Hi, welcome to the Faith Over Fear podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Slattery. I'm an author, a speaker, and a ministry leader, and I am passionate about helping people live in freedom because life is too short and we have too much to do for any of us to live enslaved. I would love to connect with you online and on social media. Just Google my name, Jennifer Slattery, and you can connect with my ministry, Holy Love Ministries at holylove.com. That's W-H-O-L-L-Y, Holy Love, because we are fully known and deeply loved. And today we're continuing our conversation on fear. We're going to be talking about when fear goes into overdrive, anxiety, and OCD and related conditions. We're going to be talking about how to recognize when it's become a problem, how to practice some good self-care, and when we know that when to when to tell if we need to get some extra help, maybe some therapy or some medical intervention. And I'm really excited because I have a special guest with us here today, my daughter, Ashley. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for being with us today, Ashley. She's going to be sharing from a unique perspective. Actually, maybe not, maybe... Maybe something a lot of you can resonate with, but she's going to be sharing what it's like to grow up in the evangelical community with anxiety and depression, and then also what it's like to be raised by a parent with OCD, and that would be me. Hello, I'm Jennifer Slattery, and I have OCD. Hi, Mom. <laughs> so that we're we're not going to be able to really go too deep into this topic in 30 minutes. We really just want to open the conversation. We feel like we need more safe places where people can be real with their struggle, where they can get some help. And we feel like church should be the safest place for people to be completely transparent. Yeah. And sometimes for me, it hasn't always been that place. When I started university and was looking for a college Bible group to be a part of, I went to this one church group and they had a Bible and psychology seminar that was hosted and led by a university psychology professor. And I was pretty excited about that because it wasn't something I had really ever heard talked about in the church before. And I went and the psychology professor said that anxiety and depression weren't real and that you just needed to pray and read your Bible more. And I realized that I could not be myself with the group. And I wanted to clarify. So he was actually a Christian professor, yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you were excited to have those two disciplines merge? Yeah, because faith isn't really talked a lot about in the science fields in university. So, you know, I mean, I never really heard professors be vocal about their faith mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And and how many people showed up? A ton. It was more than just my campus church group. There was pretty much, I think, all the campus church groups there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not surprised with that because statistics tell us 60% of college students struggle with debilitating depression and anxiety, where it is actually getting in the way for many of them of their ability to successfully complete their schoolwork and, and just to transition into that next phase. So I'm sure a lot of them were coming wanting help. Yeah, yeah. I at least was. Mm, and how did you feel? Well, after the group, I talked with my, after the session, I talked with my friends in the group about it. And, you know, because I wasn't sure, like, hey, maybe just because the speaker said this doesn't mean that the people in the group actually believe that. Um, but they did. And I realized that I could never be open and honest with them. And I stopped going to the group. And one reason why that story, she shared it with me before, actually, and it really concerns me because here you have kids at a time when they really are wanting help. Some of them are probably desperately needing help and don't quite know how to get it or where to go. And not only were they then basically told that was not a safe place for them, but then they also received the message, which is false, by the way, that there was something wrong between them and God. Yeah, because if 
you know, you're anxious because you're not praying enough. That means you're anxious because you're not close enough with God. Correct. And, you know, I do have to say there are times when that is when our relationship, when there is a very real spiritual cause to depression and anxiety. If we are not walking in God's will, if we're not living the way that he desires for us, then, yeah, we're probably going to be depressed and anxious. But there's also times when, and I've seen this a lot, when it couldn't, can be because of hurts we've experienced in the past. And then mm -hmm. we can carry that into adulthood and it can cause anxiety and depression. And sometimes it can be circumstantial. Mm -hmm. Like if you have a test, you're going to be anxious. Yes. <laughs> and then it should go away as soon as you finish the test. But there's also times when it has a very biomedical cause. Yep. Brain chemistry is a funky thing. It, it absolutely is. And I think we recognize when it comes to like diabetes or a broken foot that our bodies are in many ways broken mm -hmm. and that we need intervention we need medical intervention but we don't always recognize that when it comes to mental health i think too sometimes we don't recognize in ourselves when we're struggling. So I think there's some of that also. Yeah, I know for me, you know, I was always told that, you know, you need to pray to God and he'll give you joy. And, you know, it's kind of hard to know what's going on in other people's brains. So I assumed everybody else was like me and they were just handling their life better. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do want to hit pause here because I think that there's a misconception with that as well in that biblical joy is not an emotion. And I think so many of us carry condemnation thinking, I don't have joy, therefore I don't have the fruit of the Spirit, and therefore I'm not close with God. Biblical joy, it has the same root word in the Greek as grace. And it's, an, it's a knowledge, a deep assurance that God is sovereign, that He loves us, and that He's working in the situation. So we can be grieving intensely while experiencing joy, because we're grieving with the knowledge that even though this is really painful— God is still with us and he will and he is still working all things out to our good. And so I think some of that sounds like you experienced that too is like why am I not feeling happy mm -hmm. when I'm praying? Yeah. So how did you I guess move forward to understand when did you first become alert that hey maybe maybe this isn't something that I can manage on my own and maybe kind of lead us in that journey. Well, I did, you know, I was able to talk to my friends about it and with my parents about it. And I realized that it was negatively affecting my life. It was limiting the things that I was able to do because, you know, a lot of people think that depression is just being sad and weepy all the time. But for me, depression is just being really tired and really uninterested. And so I wasn't doing a lot of the adulting things that I should have been doing. And so I decided to get help and started seeing a counselor. How, how does depression and anxiety relate? I mean, are those two related or? Yeah, I mean, for me, I have both of them. They're not for everybody. But anxiety, you know, makes me anxious to do things. And so then I don't do the things. But then that's keeping me from doing self-care stuff that could help me with my depression. And then I feel bad because I didn't accomplish those things. And it becomes this cycle of like, I'm anxious, and then I'm depressed, and then I'm both, and then it's mm -hmm. not fun. Mm -hmm. It was actually when you were in North Carolina, I will admit that I was frightened. Because mm -hmm. I was watching, I'm still learning, I think I was still learning at that point, what you were going through, and what is something that we could manage, and something you maybe needed help with, and that was a really tough summer. Well, yeah, I was, I was gone on an internship. So I was away from friends and family and without my support network and in a different area. And that's where I started seeing a counselor that was really helpful. And she, you know, I did a lot. She helped me get started on self care stuff to, you know, help me feel better. What were those? Um, I would go to the gym every day after work. I would take walks outside on weekends. Um, I adopted a dog. She's been very helpful. Um, I made sure that I would do art every day because art therapy is amazing. 
Um, but for me, it, it just wasn't quite enough. Mm -hmm. Well, and I will say, was it easy to do those things? No. no. Why? I, well, like, depression made me uninterested. So mm -hmm. I, it was, like, doing art and sometimes even playing video games, things that I knew should make me happy, felt like a chore. Mm -hmm. So how did you get over that, that first step? Like, how did you actually make it to the gym? I didn't always. Mm -hmm. Um, but I had a personal trainer, and so the accountability helped mm, me. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think that would be a good opportunity when we share with our friends as well, being open with them. And you were in an environment where actually you were pretty new, and so you didn't have support systems. Mm -hmm. But potentially, if you're in a place where you it, – it's so important to let people know, hey, I'm struggling. Yeah, and right now, me and my friends talk about, you know, our mental health stuff all the time, and I know it's helped them, and it's really helped me. So I have OCD, like the legit kind. Everybody kind of jokes, hey, I keep my pins organized. That's not me. I'm she vacuum. She used to vacuum. All the time. Constantly, every day. Yeah, well, and I, but I don't keep pins organized or that sort of thing. That's not my, so with me, and maybe it's probably different with everybody else, but initially it was schedule following and kind of how I raised my daughter. I had certain things in my mind that this was what it meant to raise your child in a good way. And if it was in my brain that that was what I was supposed to do, then if I didn't follow that perfectly, I would feel anxious. And so like if I thought she was supposed to go to bed at seven every night, and it was 7.15, I would begin to feel anxious. And I didn't recognize that those were OCD feelings that were arising. I knew I felt anxious, but I didn't recognize why. And then later, I transitioned to exercise. And our family, everybody kind of was alert to mom's exercise schedule. Yeah, we knew not to talk to her until after she's had her run. I didn't recognize at the time. I was actually practicing self-care. And so that was very beneficial. But I do want to kind of mention... She said, everybody knew, don't talk to mom after she had her run. And that's, if you don't have open dialogue regarding mental health, especially in the family, then it, everybody gets sucked into the mental illness. And so in our family, we didn't, we didn't know that I had OCD. And so everybody spent their energy and their thoughts making mom okay, making sure mom was calm, making sure mom was at peace, making sure mom wasn't anxious and that is a really hard way to live as a child yeah it, it was I don't know it was normal for me but it as I like got older and talked to counselors I realized that it was part of the reason why I had anxiety mm -hmm. you know just having to be alert all of the time mm -hmm. well you say it was normal for you but at the same time it was not peaceful for you no because you were on hyper alert all the time Mm -hmm. And it's not a healthy dynamic either when the child begins to care for the emotions of the parent. Yeah, sometimes I know you would get annoyed at me because I would be asking you if you were okay every five minutes. <laughs> so, uh, but then also you had shared with me later. So I transitioned from exercise. I got sick in 2011 and I got really sick for a while. And so I couldn't exercise anymore, which had been my coping mechanism for my entire life pretty much and all of a sudden I couldn't do those things anymore and mom got cranky I got cranky and a little weird I my OCD shifted to germs mm -hmm. because I felt like I couldn't control what was going on in my body but I could control what went into my mouth yeah, and in your environment around you. You were right. cleaning everything all the time. Right. And I wouldn't know why. I, I didn't know why I was sick. I didn't know if it was... A, I mean, I, I eventually realized, okay, if it's going on this long, it's not a virus. But I still just kind of latched on. And our brain does funny things. The more we're afraid of something and avoid that thing, it's like we're giving our brain proof. Hey, that's... That's really terrifying. That's really dangerous. Never go near it ever again. And so every time I was avoiding germs, I was just reinforcing that fear. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I was causing deep pain. Yeah, when your mom's cleaning everything all the time, it's kind of hard to not feel like you're gross. Yeah, and I didn't recognize that had you had been carrying that 
for I don't know how long you carried that, probably yeah. since I got sick until you were able to share it with me. Yeah, yeah. I had a counselor that helped me figure out how to talk to my mom. And, you know, I think stuff got better for both me and my mom once we figured out how to talk to each other about mm-hmm. stuff. What, was it frightening to you to initiate that conversation? Yeah, yeah. It was because I didn't want to hurt your feelings. Mm. So, because I knew it wasn't something you could control. Mm-hmm. But it was something that was hurting me, so I had to tell you about it. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. By you telling me, so a lot of times we avoid tough conversations because we think it's going to hurt the other person or we're afraid of how they'll respond. But our relationship was pretty tense before Mm -hmm. you shared that with me because we had she had this underlying pain that was triggered every time I washed my hands, probably. Mm -hmm. And I was reacting off of her triggers, And Mm -hmm. so I was hurt, feeling like she was pulling away from me. So we had just this mess of hurt that nobody was talking about. And then once you had the courage to talk to me, we were able to deal with what was really going on. Yeah. Well, luckily, you and Dad have always been pretty easy to talk to. So even though it was a tough conversation and I was scared... We did have, like, the base of that I had always told you guys everything anyways, Mm -hmm. which made it easier. And Mm -hmm. I know not everybody has that with their parents. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, why not? Whether it's with our parents or with a spouse or with a friend, when we don't feel like we can be completely real and honest, especially about issues like this, it's usually out of fear. And, uh, And especially when people tell us, hey, I mean, it wasn't easy for Ashley To hear Ashley say, hey, mom, I feel like I'm gross to you. I mean, that was hard to Mm -hmm. hear. And often when people are confronting us with these hard behaviors, our first response is fear. We're afraid that we're going to lose the relationship or maybe that they're rejecting us. And sometimes, at least for me, I would feel like, I can't help this. What if I can't fix this? And so that was another layer of fear. But if we can dial down our fear and just listen We actually make the relationship stronger. So everything we were afraid of occurring most likely will not. And in fact, everything we hoped would would happen that we're trying to hold tight to, we're actually going to gain. Yeah. Me and mom are still friends. Better now, I would say. Yes. There's, There's less underlying tension. And so... In both of our situations, it took some time. It took Mm -hmm. some working through some things. I still choose. Ashley's on medication, and I'd like you to walk us along those steps in a minute. But I am not currently. I'm doing Mm -hmm. self-care, and whether it's working for me or not, I guess you could ask my my daughter. But I think you're doing a lot better. So (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) One of the things that I do is... I am very mindful of my thoughts. And so neuroscientists have have learned recently that our thoughts develop, like our they call it neuroplasticity. So our brain is constantly rewiring itself and our thoughts can develop these channels or these pathways. And so when we continually, like when I'm continually thinking about germs, you can almost think of it as like when it rains and streams create these channels and they go deeper and they deeper until they form these ruts. And then it feels almost impossible to redirect our thinking. But we can do that. It just takes practice and perseverance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can take therapy and intervention and all of those things. But for me, I like to pause and focus on some things I know to be true about God, Mm -hmm. like his power, his presence, his love. And I like to go through each of those characteristics, especially as they relate to whatever I'm anxious about. I like to praise. I like to sing praise songs. Yep. She sings a lot, all the time. Very loud. Not very good either. Well, I am tone (laughs) deaf, so there, there is that. And you went through some of these steps, but yeah. in a different way. Well, counselors call what you were talking about cognitive behavioral therapy. And how you do that is you notice that you're feeling anxious. And so then you're like, okay, when did I start feeling anxious? What happened that I started feeling that way? So you're looking for a trigger. And then in the future, you're like, oh, I'm not actually worried about a thing. I'm in an anxious spot. And then, so you try to sit down and focus and redirect your thoughts. And 
Um, you know, that and the self-care, it, it never really was enough for me. I was still really struggling. I was really struggling with consistency with How self-care. How long did you try the self-care? A, a oh, good time. Yeah, yeah, at least a couple years. I've been going on and off to therapy since I was about 10. Mm -hmm. But um, once I was in college, I really, you know, started needing more. And so at least for a couple years. Let's talk about therapists because... They can be amazing. Yeah. I've had some great therapists and I've had some not so great therapists. Just like any other field. Yes. You can have great doctors and some not so great doctors. And sometimes it has to be a personality fit, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Like certain, did certain therapists feel like a better fit for you than yeah. others? Oh yeah, definitely. I like the counselor that I have now, mm -hmm. you know, through my university. Mm -hmm. And, but really it's somebody who is paid to listen to you. Yep. Without any skin in the game. Yeah, they're a great, like, third party. They're paid to like you, so you're never going to say anything that upsets them. Right. And really, they their first desire is not to medicate you. No, no. it. They tried everything before they gave me medication. And um, really, I'm still on a very low dose. They started me off on a really, really low dose, mm -hmm. and they upped it very, very slowly. And, you know... Lately, they've made a lot of medical advancements in that field, and so the medication that I'm on, I can come off of really easily if I need to. And I would probably, as a word of caution, if you go see a therapist and they're automatically talking medication within the first month and you are not in crisis, mm -hmm. then that is probably a sign that you need to see someone else. I'm on medication now, and... Um, I found out that my dad calls them my adulting pills because they really do help me adult. They help me do the dishes. They help me stay focused in class. And they help me be a nicer person, too. Which, yeah, let's talk about that. Because I, when you came home, so when she was in North Carolina, we brought her home pretty frequently. Yeah. And one of the reasons we did this is we wanted to always speak hope. We wanted her to always have something to look forward to. And I think that's important for if you're struggling with anything to intentionally create things in, that you can look forward to. But Ashley would get off the plane very cheerful. Yes. Friday I would be great. Very engaged. <laughs> We would, I don't know if it was Sunday, I don't remember what, we took you back to the yeah, uh, yeah, Sunday I afternoon. Would, mm -hmm. So maybe at lunch, she was a bear. Yeah, I was not a pleasant person because I was, you know, upset and anxious. I didn't want to go back. You were hurting. Yeah, yeah. And when people hurt, they're, they hurt others. Right. And, and... One day we're having lunch together and she was being kind of snarky and honestly it hurt my feelings because I felt like she was annoyed at every word and facial expression I gave. Yeah, but life was just annoying it, me at that point. So. Right. And then she got up to go to the bathroom and I sensed God whisper to my heart, she's depressed. And so I had a conversation with my husband, with her daddy, and I said, She's acting like this because she's depressed. And I think that was a little bit of an alert to us tying behavior. We knew she was depressed because she was sharing with us. It was the first time we had really tied certain behaviors to her mood. And so mm -hmm. it gave us a different view. And we, were, we had that conversation with you when you came back. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, yeah. And that was when we both started to look at... And once I was aware of it, I, you know, could control it a little more. Not completely, but, but we found an even better solution. Yeah. What was the better solution? Medication. Well, and dealing with the underlying yeah. cause. And yeah. So you didn't always feel like you had to fit this mold. Yeah, and medication isn't a fix-all. For me, it doesn't make it doesn't make me happy. It doesn't fix my anxiety. It doesn't fix my depression. It just makes it so that I can do the self-care things that do fix my anxiety and depression. Because without the medication, I wasn't consistent. I couldn't do those things, but now I can. Because medication isn't the fix, the self-care is. I've experienced or I've noticed in the evangelical community, and maybe it's across the, the spectrum, people sometimes are fearful to admit their struggles. Yeah. And they're fearful to get help. What do you think it is that makes us afraid 
to really say, hey, I've got some legitimate issues and I need help. What do you think are some things that maybe could hinder that? Well, um, I know that I was worried that, you know, if this went on a medical record, would it be something that jobs could find out about? Would I, you know, would it hurt me from getting jobs if I was on medications? Would that be something I would have to talk to people about? And, you know, also afraid of getting judged, you know, like, what will people think of me if I don't have my life 100% together? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I was having to admit that I wasn't enough. And that was hard. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, jobs aren't privy to your private medical information. So they'll never know unless you tell them. And chances are your boss will be on anxiety meds or, or will need be, them. Or need them. <laughs> if, correct. I mean, just statistic, yeah. statistically speaking, so many of us struggle. Yeah. Me and, me and my current college life group, we talk to each other about like, oh, what? This is what my counselor said this week. And it really helped me. You should think about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once you're able to start talking about it, really, like, I wasn't judged by the people that I thought I was going to be, the people that matter, they love you, and will accept you. And if they love you, they'll want to help you. You might have to educate them a little. Yeah. Because you have had people with misconceptions. Yeah, not everybody understands because it's hard to understand what you don't struggle with. Well, that's true. And then what about getting help? Like going to see a counselor, what do you think are some of the fears? Did you have fears? Well, my anxiety makes it hard for me to talk on the phone. I don't know why. Anxiety isn't logical. It doesn't make sense. So I know it was hard for me to schedule appointments. So I still make my mom schedule a lot of appointments for me. At times, but when yes. you're in North Carolina, you did really well. Yeah, yeah. I And so I know just sometimes making that first step. People don't know where to go, and it mm -hmm. can be scary searching for that because you have to talk to people and ask questions and tell lots of people that you need help. That's, that's humbling. Yeah, it is. What makes it easier, do you think? Well, it is starting to be talked about a lot more. If you start to talk about it, you'll probably find out that a lot of friends of mm -hmm. yours struggle with it. Um, there's a lot of resources out there if you start to look. Um, there's a lot of free counseling through universities. And, you know, there's online help. And, you know, really there's a lot more out there than you think. Mm -hmm. So just to recap, we talked a lot today just about some great self-care. Mm -hmm. Exercise. Face art. masks. Face masks. Okay. Yes. To make yourself feel better. Yeah. Yeah. St relaxing stuff. Scented candles. Shopping mm -hmm. trips. Shopping trips. Just leave your credit card at home if you tend to to cope through through spending. Mm -hmm. That probably will only exasperate your problem. So, and then we also looked at sometimes therapy, almost all the time, in fact, I would think therapy is very, very helpful. Yeah, because they'll help you figure out what's wrong. You know, you don't have to know. They'll help you figure it out. Right. These are important steps to take, though, because like I shared, our brain is constantly rewiring itself. And so the more we stay in our mess, the harder it's going to be to climb out. Mm -hmm. And so we may need the help to do so. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. We're going to have show notes for you. Just if you can find them at crosswalk.com backslash podcast. I'll have some notes about what we talked about here today and also some resources. And if you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to subscribe and I would encourage you to rate it and make sure to share it with your friends and share it on social media. That would encourage me so much. And in the meantime, remember, life is too short and we have too much to do for any of us to live enslaved. And like my daughter mentioned, we may not fully overcome anxiety. We may have to learn to thrive. In fact, we probably will have to learn to thrive with it, mm -hmm. but we can't. Yeah. And so if this is where you're at, if you're struggling with this, just keep moving forward. Keep drawing closer to Jesus. Initiate those conversations. Have the courage to have tough conversations. And if somebody else is opening a conversation with you, have the courage to listen with love and without judgment. Until next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to Faith Over Fear a production of Life Audio 
and the Salem Web Network. If you enjoyed what you heard today, we'd love for you to head over to your favorite podcast app and leave us a review. To learn more about Jennifer Slattery or to check out any of the resources she mentioned in this episode, just head over to her website, jenniferslatterylivesoutloud.com, or check out our show notes. This episode was produced by Kelly Givens and edited by Stephen Sanders. A special thanks to our executive producer, Stephen McGarvey. For more Faith Toolkit podcasts like this, just head over to lifeaudio.com.